Now kicking off with our first session, we have Matthew Putman. He is the co-founder and CEO of Nanotronics. You know, we talk about industrial automation as an emerging trend, and we can't imagine anyone who would be better to talk about this topic than the company that does factory control. Nanotronics, um, Nanotronics has a platform that uses AI and automation as well as sophisticated imaging to detect flaws and waste in a manufacturing process. A cool fun fact about what Nanotronics is doing locally is that they're building New York's first smart factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. To haze Matthew on state, we have our very own Wu Jin Ho. He is BI Senior Networking and Midcap Semis Analyst. Please take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm going to kick off the event, like Boyan says. Uh, I am the uh, networking and semiconductor analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. So we are pleased to host and kick off the, uh, the event uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew Putman, founder and CEO of Nanotronics. Just quickly about uh, Dr. Putman's uh, background. He is an expert in quantum computing and the founding mentor of, uh, member of the Quantum Industrial uh, Industry Coalition. He has a PhD in applied mathematics and physics from Columbia University. Um, he has published 30 papers and holds 15 patents in his work on devices, instrumentation, and software processes. Uh, Nanotronics and NSPEC is the realization of the, uh, and the productization of his vision and all of his good work. Now, as Boyung has highlighted and overviewed, uh, the, the vision of Nanotronics is to disrupt the manufacturing and development process. Uh, the company's NSPEC platform uh, combines nanotechnology with uh, artificial intelligence, automation, and imaging technologies to essentially detect flaws and anom anomalies in the manufacturing process uh, while reducing the flaws with the aim of developing an optimal end product, essentially a perfect product uh, to redu while reducing waste. Now, um, the fun fact, again, is that uh, you know, Nanotronics is a key player in revitalizing the New York City's manufacturing and industrial sector. He is building uh, New York's first smart factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is just across the uh, Hudson River. And the factory, uh, the facility aims to build a cohesive manufacturing floor and a shop floor by allowing the scientists, researchers, programmers to work directly with the machinists. Uh, we should see the new, uh, new facility, and we were talking about this earlier, we're excited to see the new facility, hopefully to later this year, either in 2Q or 3Q of, of 2020. Um, but enough about you know, me overviewing nanotronics, I'm gonna uh, pass it over to uh, Dr. Putman. Oh, thanks so much, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I, I think they covered really well um, our basic idea, which is to make something that does uh, imaging for uh, being able to improve process control. Um, I think that the reasons why we do it um, matter a bit more to me. Um, when we look at uh, in industry and process control, the way everything's made, not the apps that ride above them, there, there really hasn't been great change since the 1950s. Um, it's not a matter of even simple disruption. It's a matter of thinking entirely differently. And it really couldn't be done until now. So now you're able to combine um, super resolution imaging. So this is a way of seeing things that were not being able to be seen at very high resolutions. This is important when making semiconductors, um, when making flow cells for genomics. Um, it, and now being able to use closed loop artificial intelligence systems. Um, when we think about AI in general, we think about um, how it's used for personal devices, how it's used for, um, you know, how Amazon uses it for Echo. We think about the end application, but often not only do we not think about how AI can be used in manufacturing, it's just not being used in manufacturing. Now, it's hard to blame manufacturing companies for this because it really wasn't until about 2015 that this was even possible. Uh, so what Nanotronics has done was you know, I, I started out in kind of a strange career path, having worked in industry. Um, so I saw things being brought to scale, lower profit margin businesses like uh, chemical companies and tire companies, where I have this sort of family legacy of having worked in, and worked in process control. 
to working in a university lab environment where you have no scale at all. So the whole purpose is to take things like artificial intelligence, to take discoveries that were made in a lab, and then scale them in industry. This is a different paradigm of how things are thought of. Great. Why, why, why don't we dig into nanote nanotechnology itself, right? You dedicated your career to nanotechnology, first in academia and then at nan nanotronics. Now, I recall the hype around uh, nanotechnology was quite high about four or five years ago, and then the hype all of a sudden died down, right? The, 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 the classic Gartner hype cycle hype curve. Now, if, if we can visualize a hype cycle curve today, what do you think nanotechnology is on, on, on that curve? And are we starting to get out of this trough of disillusionment? Well, part of these things have to do not exactly with reality, but about how people relate the definition mm -hmm. of, of a hyped term. So nanotechnology means something to different people in different ways, just like artificial intelligence is a hyped word that means something to different people. Um, nanotechnology, in the sense of using very small things for in, in different industries, including, you would say, the semiconductor industries working on the nanoscale. You know, the hype or not, it's really what drives uh, electronics and drives, um, you know, what goes on in our lives. But nanotechnology as the dream and nanotechnology as the possibilities for dealing with very large things like um, in, in incredible reduction of waste, um, in, in cre uh, life expectancy and uh, things that have stagnated in society in general, it's going to see this convergence with the other hype term of artificial intelligence where some of those things that were talked about, I would say 20 years ago, can now become a possibility. Um, and we're seeing this in, in the semiconductor industry, we're seeing it in, uh, in being able to take what was protein folding and actually be able to create molecules. And we're taking quantum, you know, we're at the early stages of where quantum computing will be able to do simulations so that you will actually be able to build things on the nanoscale. So, you know, we're, we're somehow still at the beginning of that, that sort of large nanotech dream, but in the next five to 10 years, it becomes a major part of our lives. Sure. Well, why, why don't we level set the, the audience a little bit? Sure. You know, why, don't, why don't we define uh, nanotechnology and, and the nano scale. Uh, what, what is that definition uh, in, in, in your mind uh, so we can have a, you know, so we can understand where your perspective is? Yeah, so when I talk about nanotechnology, um, m many people speak about nanotechnology uh, as being, you know, anything that works in a scale of less than 100 nanometers. Uh, nanotechnology to to me is something that can be manufactured at, at that scale from the bottom up. Um, there's famous um, a speech by the physicist Richard Feynman in, in, in 1957 um, called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom that inspired a lot of us in nanotechnology that if you could, you could have, you could, about any property that we care about could be realized if you get down to these molecular scale. This is how I look at it. This is where you have the potential to move and control nano machinery. Uh, this, is a, this is a much bigger deal than having things such as coatings um, or, or uh, affecting the petrochemical industry or even the traditional semiconductor industry by being under this 100 nanometer scale. Got it, got it. Now, now you, you were talking about the semis and, and the petrochemical industries. Um, are, are those the industries that are, that are using the, uh, the nanotechnology the most today? Is that technology most pervasive in those areas? And in the future, what other industries and sectors do you think will start adopting uh, some of the technologies that you provide? So I, I certainly, when anybody thinks about precise control of things on that scale, being able to keep up with Moore's law has required it. So that's where, that's why we're all have the devices and have everything that we have in our life this way. Certainly coatings to sunscreens and all of this use nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. Not quite as large of a deal, I think, than trying to build the foundational technologies of our time. Where it will be used is, 
you know, whether we're talking about strict definitions of nanotechnology now or not, we have to figure out new ways of keeping a Moore's Law type thing going. And that's going to involve manipulation on the nanoscale by using AI systems to correct for defects, to be able to control systems that have been very hard to control in the past. So getting rid of the types of architectures of semiconductors that have been considered standard and the only way to do it and move to things like three-dimensional architectures, three new types of materials that have better properties, and then eventually to things um, that are actual nanofillers uh, that can do computation, such as graphene. Got it. Now, now you mentioned graphene. Um, I was able to go through some of the case studies that, that, that you provide on your website. And if I look at some of your earlier deals, um, it seems as if Nanotronics was involved with uh, gallium nitride or GAN technologies. And then this was five years ago. Right? Ten years ago. And this was ten years ago. Now, now GAN is actually starting to come into proven, uh, prominence in uh, modern day technology as it relates to power chips, as well as it relates to uh, radio frequency chips. Um, you know, at, at the time uh, with GAN, what were some of the problems uh, that the customer is trying to solve to bring that problem to market and how were you able to solve it? So um, GAN and others that fall into this larger category called compound semiconductors that, that use materials that are other than just silicon um, ha had enormous challenges. It had enormous upside that everybody's known about for a long time. And that's this upside to much better power efficiency has the ability, ability to work in three dimensions, so you didn't have to try to pack more nodes onto a two-dimensional surface. But you grow this in a chamber. And ev every layer that you grow of a material that's a complex structure can introduce flaws. And as you introduce these defects, it propagates through, throughout the structure. So you end up with something that's very expensive, that has fairly low yields, that doesn't have the kind of throughput that you normally have. Nanotronics came to address this by saying that if you could identify, if you could classify, detect, classify in real time where these defects were, then you could make adjustments to the process uh, and figure out how to make a more scalable technology. Now we're taking this one step further, which is saying we're not just giving feedback <coughs> to humans on how to fix a process, but actually giving feedback to machinery to make corrective actions in real time. Now that couldn't have happened until five years ago when running deep learning systems and running AI in, in real time was possible. Got it. Now, now, now GAN was 10 years ago and you accelerated the process and now we're starting to come to market. Um, I, I'm sure our audience members are looking for the new, new thing. Uh, what are some of the problems uh, that you can disclose that customers are trying to solve today and and how quickly do you think you can accelerate the time to market given that you have let's just say the holy trinity of AI, ML and enhanced imaging uh, under um, your, your one device? Right, so I, I, I'm going to of course answer your question but the extreme of this that I see is much more than often either markets or individuals, I think, tend to, to notice. Uh, therefore, pointing out the necessity of doing something like being able to create materials made of GAN or eventually of graphene and all these other products. I, uh, I look at a smartphone, for instance, and I, I see mild iterations, minor iterations, that make our lives slightly better. Um, <laughs> but it's also more expensive and make it and you know one of these reasons is to make a semiconductor fab is enormously expensive i think there's a, more, a recent fab that cost 28 million do, billion dollars 28 billion dollars for a factory was unthinkable when semiconductors were starting to be produced and is still unthinkable for almost any other industry so a problem that's being faced is if you're going to continue to make semiconductors the way you are, you're still going to have this increase in fab cost. So it's going to eventually trickle down and still does to having a minor change 
um, in something like a, a, a smartphone um, not becoming less expensive while still having not as many features. So strangely enough, you can have fabs that are much less expensive, much smaller, uh, and much, many less layers of potential problems as you go through a process if you're going to make a GAN factory, for instance. If we're to do that, you have less expensive fabs, you have better uh, power efficiency, and you have 3D architectures. The way that we have to do that is to make sure that we have process control along each part of that process. This is a huge opportunity for people. And if you look at those markets, the compound semiconductor market is the fastest growing market in the semiconductor industry, even though remaining relatively small um, compared to the traditional semiconductor market. So yes, we want to detect defects. We want to not just detect them, we want to correct for them in the process so that you never have to throw away a wafer and you instead have something that uses something called reinforcement learning agents to be able to make changes in the process. That's where we think the future is going. Um, it'll be increasingly smaller fabs and increasingly more power efficient wafers and devices uh, that, that are able to do things that are radically better than we're currently seeing. Right. So, so, so this actually pivots very well to the next topic in terms of factory, factory automation. And it seems as if you are trying to disrupt the marketplace. You have a $28 billion fab uh, metric that, that you're throwing out there. I mean, where, does, where do you think that you can have the, uh, the fab manufacturing costs uh, lower too over time? Um, I mean, are, are we talking about instead of a capex investment of twenty-eight billion, can a, a mid-tier semiconductor company uh, make a, you know, let's say a two to three billion dollar investment over multiple years to compete with someone like a TSMC or or, or an AMAT? Yeah, um, and I hope it's much less than touching the billions. And this is why I'm, I'm interested in a lot of the startup companies or growth companies that have less than a billion dollars worth of investment that are going from design to pilot manufacturing. Um, this is very much a possibility. It's being done on a smaller scale already. Uh, and it's, it's not even so much than taking on TSMC. It's, TSMC will also ha uh, have every desire to iterate their process to be right. different. But as we know, large companies often tend to move a bit slower. So we will see how that evolves. But yes, the smaller the factory, the more vertically integrated the factory, which is another thing that I happen to have a lot of passion for, and we talk a little bit about how Nanotronics does this on our small scale. The more of this that you have, the faster to design iteration you'll have, and, and by doing that, solving problems and being able to put, you know, to have the type of throughputs that are needed. And, and, and I'm curious, what's, how should I think about your customer base? in terms of the size of your customers uh, that um, use the, the NSPEC technology? It completely ranges from the largest of these semiconductor mm -hmm. companies to the, lar to the largest um, uh, makers of, of uh, hard drives that power the cloud mm -hmm. um, to the largest uh, makers of genome sequencing equipment um, to uh, chemical companies. When you're working with an AI platform like this, mm -hmm. And one thing, by the way, that I should have addressed when talking about why this is possible, how you make a cheaper fab, it, it's because you don't need incredibly expensive physical equipment anymore for doing measurement and for doing processing. You have computation that can do this in ways that physical things never were able to be done. Um, so th this is a, a huge driver of how you're going to bring down costs. Got it. Now, now, now. Um, uh, part of the, the value creation that you're doing is, is leveraging uh, machine learning and AI to essentially teach the AI ML like uh, engine. You, you have there's a manual process that's involved, and I believe we're still in the early days of AI and ML. And, and you alluded to that in your prepared remarks in terms of we're still in the early days of quantum computing, and you can still inject a lot more to further enhance your product and also enhance the um, the process. Where do you see the AIML technology going over the next several years to 
either make your product better or other yeah. products better. Yeah, so the product that you referred to, the InSpec, which is what we sell, we do leverage sparse amounts of train data. So there are humans that are looking at different defects. There are experts that are working on this. But we are now working on a completely unsupervised learning technique. Reinforcement learning agents, the most sort of memorable, I think, to a lot of people is when division of um, Alphabet called DeepMind beat uh, the world champion Go player, something called AlphaGo. This is an unsupervised system where you know, these reinforcement learning agents are lear uh, are have a, f a goal of winning the game and trying different combinations of doing this and being penalized or rewarded to do that. This is something that is unheard of in factories. Um, but this is the way that it, do, it, it doesn't require a human to try to figure out things on, at a time and at a scale that is impossible for humans to do. So do, using unsupervised learning to control a factory is something that we will see this year. I mean, this is, this is being deployed right now. We are, th this is, you know, a fact uh, which I want to say is different than simulating how a factory should run. The, generally, the way that AI is used in that fashion is taking the way that a factory process runs, simulating how it should run, and then applying those conditions. In this world, it's a completely closed loop system so that the factory itself be, becomes the AI system and the learning system. Great. Well, why don't we pivot over to some of the accomplishments that uh, you're doing at the, the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard. Uh, it, it, you know, you're one of the few companies that's bringing smart uh, manufacturing uh, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, it seems, right? And, and it's part of the whole modernization uh, and the industrial, uh, of the industrial park, right? Um, can you just share with the audience that uh, what is New York City trying to do at the Brooklyn Navy Yard? Yeah, so... I'll speak to why what I'm trying to do at the Brooklyn <laughs> Navy Yard a little bit, and I think it certainly aligns with what the city and the city's been mm -hmm. very supportive. Uh, I hope that we're, by the way, not going to be the only ones doing this. Mm -hmm. So th this is I'm not looking for a monopoly on being a smart factory in Brooklyn. We want the whole world to be a lot of smart factories and them to be partners with Nanotronics if possible. Uh, but. Uh, I, I think that if you look at the Brooklyn Navy Yards, it was the largest employer of manufacturing in the tri-state area until around the 1960s. There, there's something that I really care about, which is being in a city environment like New York, where you have the best cuisine, you have the, the best in finance and in arts, and actually making the physical things that are around us. So, you know, we talk about connecting a supply chain within our company, within a single factory. We also want to connect a city. Uh, in the factory itself, the idea is to run this closed loop system on the things that we actually make. So we make robotics. We make these uh, microscope systems that do uh, the analysis in factories. So we want to practice what we preach in a sense. So we have our AI engineers overlooking a machine shop floor that's making robotics, increasing the yields of those, so therefore then passing savings down to customers to open less expensive fabs. Uh, this, this is the kind of blueprint that we then can take other places and that maybe other companies do in Brooklyn and in other cities like Brooklyn. And, and, and it's clear that you have a passion not only for the inspection technologies, but also the manufacturing process itself. You were talking about how your lineage is from uh, rubber tires, right? Yeah. If, I, if I if I believe, right? And you know, what what do you think we we are in in the smart manufacturing? I, I read somewhere in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago that Tyson is using smart technologies as part of the the chicken inspection process. You know, and, and it sounds like you are trying to apply what your learnings to other industries is. Is that the vision that you were trying to outlay? Yes, absolutely. All industries are behind. In, in, I mean, it, I don't. I don't want to say that we are particularly. I mean, we're just building this factory, but the, the it should apply to every industry. The more efficient we get 
in one industry, the less waste we have anywhere. And waste can mean environmental waste, waste of human potential. We also, by the way, use reinforcement learning to have craftsmanship and have things that are manufactured by humans, which is still over 90% of the things that are made, but being assisted through reinforcement learning. Um, this can, so it can apply to anything from making shoes to making semiconductors to making tires. It, it needs to have a ripple effect throughout all industry in order to make very large change in the world. Uh, we have about 40 seconds left. Do you, do you want to predict? Let's look into your crystal ball. When do you think we can realize this vision? Oh, I think we'll start to see it in the next year, and I think that it'll be commonplace in five years. For the in, for all across multiple industries. across multiple industries, not necessarily every company, but in in most verticals. Great. We have about 20 seconds left. I could field one question. If there's anybody. Yeah, I guess question for uh, both you, Dr. Pavin and Bujan. So I think you've laid out a great secular case, um, secular vote case for smart manufacturing. I wonder if you could provide some thoughts on cyclicality. Um, if you look at companies like Cognex, Kia, and companies that you guys both know well, mm -hmm. they've been in this downturn, synchronized in autos and industrials and consumer electronics. So I was wondering, number one, can you help us understand your perspective of how they've got overordered to begin with? And secondly, what signs are you guys looking forward to? Uh, see a recovery in spending. Yeah, I, I think that we have to start thinking about CapEx spending differently and we have to think about supply chains differently. Otherwise, we get stuck in this type of, uh, of stagnation and, 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 and stuck in cyclical potentially potential problems. We need to be very aligned with customers, which becomes very recession-proof um, as you have an alignment between those who are supplying um, solutions and those that are increasing yields. Um, so it's a different way to look at, at, at how you deal with cyclical issues. Great. Great. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Matt, Doctor. Yeah. Thank you.